Hello and welcome to part two um, of the cervical spine injury evaluation. Uh, on this particular online lecture, we'll be focusing solely on acute injuries in sport. I'm Dr. Cosby. Let us first start with um, a stopping point as we start talking about acute traumatic injuries. I think it's important for us to understand that. Remember, the major role of the cervical spine is to protect the spinal cord, right? It's to protect that spinal cord um, and its spinal nerve roots. So any injury to the cervical vertebrae and we can have catastrophic results. We've been talking a lot about chronic pathologies and that's great. But a, a lot of the sports that we cover, football, soccer, basketball, any contact sport, right? Um, the reality is there's an inherent risk for injury to the cervical spine. So I wanna do a stopping point here to take a few seconds so that I'm not bre breezing over this. And, and I wanna say this, you should not perform any cervical special tests until you've ruled out fracture, dislocation, instability. So make sure you've done that first and then you can begin the process of patient evaluation. So here we go. Let's start with mechanisms of injury. There are six different mechanisms of injury that a patient can most often describe to you. Uh, the first is an axial load where the spine is in a pretty neutral position. So there's no lordotic curve. You have a direct axial load to the top of the skull, which we call an axial load, right? And force is most often going to be distributed through the cervical spine, picked up by the T-spine the most often. The next mechanism of injury is a flexion mechanism. So that cervical spine is now down in a flexed position you can see that there the load may be to the posterior portion of the skull or the occiput and you can see that that the location of the force is going to shift a little bit to that c7 t1 uh, spinous process you can have a hyperextension injury right where the spine is hyperextended and the load is to the front part or the frontal bone of the skull and so the focus of force is going to be right there in that c5 through c7 you can have a flexion, so you have combination injuries. So you can have a flexion rotation pathology, right? Force is directed to C7 or C6. You can have a rotation hyperextension injury. Um, force will be directed right in that area. And then you can have a lateral flexion injury, which is most often going to be a stretch injury. And we'll talk about that in just a while. These are the different mechanisms. So you can see just how complex something like an acute injury to the cervical spine injury. So because we have so much range of motion in the cervical spine, there's multiple ways that it can actually be injured. So as we look at this image, what do you all think? Um, take a look at this. This is an athlete kind of butting their head up against a brick wall, let's say. Um, what we could say is if we could design the worst position for the cervical spine to be in, this would be it. So you have a little bit of, of an extension, um, maybe a little bit of an extension moment, maybe a little bit, but you have this axial load coming on the top of the skull and force is directed right here. And so what we get is a, a burst fracture or a spinal cord injury and or both. So that's gonna segue us into our first pathology or group of pathologies. You can have cervical fractures and or cervical dislocations. You don't always have both of these together. So I'm first gonna talk about the cervical fracture. Most often we see that in some form of axial load mechanism. So the load comes from the top of the skull and the force is so great that one of the vertebral bodies kind of um, absorbs it and it, it ruptures or it fractures. And so with a, a cervical uh, vertebral body fracture, the biggest concern is that it usually fragments. And, and if those fragment fragmented pieces become dislodged, it can compress on the cord, causing bilateral signs and symptoms. In addition to a cervical spinal fracture, we can have a, a, a dislocation, right? Which is like actual movement or progression of the vertebral body um, towards the spinal cord itself. And so these dislocations are more serious because they pose a more serious threat to the spinal cord. In other words, not only will they impinge um, and compress, but they'll stay in that position and cause potentially permanent damage depending on the level of the actual dislocation within the cervical spine. The mechanism of injury is not just an axial load. In fact, when we think about what it takes to dislocate a vertebral body, it's going to be that force flexion moment with a rotation moment as well. So what do we think about when we think about signs and symptoms? Since this is most often going to impact the spinal cord, right? That patient is going to have bilateral sensory, motor, um, sensory and motor deficits in two or four of the limbs. This is going to be predicated on the level of the actual cervical spine injury, right? The higher up the injury, like C1, C2, um, you're thinking all four, right? And then the lower, lower the injury is, less limbs will be involved in that particular injury. So that bilateral, those bilateral signs and symptoms could 
be anesthesia, paresthesia, um, most often though clearing within 15 minutes to 48 hours, anything outside of that. And we're concerned that it's going to be permanent in, in nature. So um, other sign symptoms uh, in a fracture or dislocation, there will be muscle spasm at the level of the fracture and a dis dislocation. If we have a dislocation, we're going to see a malalignment most often. The head will be tilted in the patient, tenderness to palpation, crapidus, of course. Um, if it impinges or impact, impacts the cauda equina, then we know that um, we certainly can have loss of bowel and bladder. The big key thing here is if a patient has anesthesia or paresthesia after a cervical spine injury, then typically we don't do range of motion and manual muscle test um, because if they have a dislocation or a cervical fracture, it could dislodge the bony fragment or cause the um, dislocated verte vertebral body to progress further and cause more damage, right? What you're going to do is conduct your full upper and lower quarter neural screens to help roll in or roll out the nerve root levels that are actually involved. If there's no pain, axial compression with two fingers pressing on the top of the head, that will help you determine whether or not you actually have a, a fracture. So I'll show you that in lab, but essentially imagine just standing on uh, your patient seated, you're putting your hands on top of their skull and you're just going to apply a very light pressure. If that causes pain, then you're concerned that they might have a cervical fracture. Our next acute uh, trauma is going to be a cervical cord trauma. So we're not talking cervical stenosis here, which is more chronic in nature. Um, we have essentially what we have is an impingement or laceration um, of the spinal cord caused by bony displacement. If we were to go back one side, let's go back. Most often that's going to be as a result of some type of cervical spine dislocation, right? So we have this bony displacement or the bony fragments that start to impinge upon the, the spinal cord itself. So we can see how injuries, acute injuries can be linked to one another, right? Um, the compression can also be caused by some type of hemorrhage or edema or a, a schema or lack of oxygen to the actual spinal cord itself. So it doesn't always have to be impingement or lacerated related. It certainly can occur if there's swelling within the vertebral canal or edema within the spinal cord, right? All of those things can also cause uh, cervical cord trauma as well. The concern with cervical cord trauma is most often it is reversible, right? If we go back here, what we said is most often the signs and symptoms will clear within two days or um, yeah, two days. But if we come back here, as we look at cervical cord trauma, it can also be irreversible, especially if necrosis occurs. So what's that cell death within the spinal cord, right? Most often necrosis is going to be linked to ischemia, a lack of oxygen getting to the spinal cord. That can be as a result of a compressional moment where um, oxygen isn't allowed to reach the spinal cord and so spinal cord cells start to die. And so in that case, it becomes a very permanent condition, which is why it's so important to refer out ASAP when you recognize the cord is actually involved, right? Okay. Pain in the cervical spine must always be thought of as catastrophic until we've ruled out all other things otherwise, right? So anytime a patient presents to us, whether that's chronic or an acute pathology, we always want to make sure that we rule out the worst case scenario first before we start actually with our process of patient evaluation, right? The worst case scenario is a fracture, dislocation, or any trauma to the, uh, the spinal cord in the cervical region. So if a patient has an acute trauma to the spinal cord um, or in a brain, the brain, we're not there yet, but or the brain um, and they are unconscious, right? So let's say they have direct trauma to the spinal cord and they are unconscious. Uh, oftentimes patients will present in specific postures because depending on how high that injury occurs to the spinal cord, we know that the spinal cord, the, the brachial plexus, will, uh, the thoracic plexus, the lumbar plexus, all those plexi are going to supply different parts of the body, whether it's the upper limb or the lower limb. So essentially what we can think about is when we have damage to the spinal cord, patient will present in specific postures. The first one is a decorticate posture. The decorticate posture re is represented by a patient whose hands are in a flexion moment. So you'll see that in the bottom picture here. Um, so most often the hands are going to be in a flex position, but you have e extension of the lower extremity. When we think about someone who's in a decorticate posture, what this means is that there is injury or uh, lesion above the brainstem. So, so oftentimes that's the thalamus or the cortex. We can also encounter a patient who has a decerebrate posture. This is a posture of extension. So they're going to have extension of the extremities, both in the arms and in the legs, um, and a retraction of the head. So the head's going to kind of push down into the ground, right? This is actually represents a lesion to the brain stem, but can also be associated with some type of, of stroke.
Now, we can also have a patient who has a flexion contracture. So this is when the arms are flexed across the chest. So that is a little bit different than a decorticate posture where we have the wrist, the fist clenched and extension of the lower limbs. The flexion contraction are the arms that will cross all the way through the chest. This would represent a cord lesion. So here's a differential, um, usually at the C5, C6 level. So you have to differentiate between a decorticate and a flexion contracture posture because one represents a brain pathology and the other will represent a, a cord injury. Both are catastrophic and both have long-term implications for, for the patients. A very kind of uncommon pathology that you might encounter in scary pathology is transient quadriplegia, right? So as the name implies, it's temporary um, quadriplegia, which means at some point in time, the patient uh, temporarily loses motor and often uh, sensory function in the arms and the legs. So you'll this will be the patient who takes a blow to the cervical spine, right? Takes a blow or a concussive force to the cervical spine. And for whatever reason, um, that blow uh, results in like a disturbance in the neur the neural transmission um, to the brain. And that will last kind of several minutes and it will gradually improve. But during those several minutes, you're just like, okay, is this patient like permanently paralyzed, right? Um, so again, it's a neuropraxia, which means it's a very temporary um, compromise to the actual spinal cord. Uh, this dysfunction can occur from a lack of oxygen um, or and or a rise in calcium circulating within the body. Most often it's caused by a subconcussive blow that really just um, is so hard that it disrupts the um, the nerves ability to communicate to the brain and so they automatically just become quadriplegia so in terms of etiology or the mechanism most often it can be hyperextension hyperflexion moment with an axial load um, which will get that so either you're looking at hyperextension which just impinges the spinal cord and shuts off all neural input where you have a hyperflexion moment with a, a, a an axial load and that load the force of it is so hard that it shuts off neural input to the brain and the patient just collapses and loses function in the limbs. Um, again, very quite scary. Um, but then as the patient starts to come around, you will see most often that they, uh, most of their function will be, will be restored. Uh, risk factors, patients who uh, have some type of spinal foramen stenosis, right? So that's a chronic pathology. So a chronic pathology can set them up uh, for risk of becoming transient quadriplegia. That has to do with this right here. They already lack oxygen supply because they're being stenosed and so not as much oxygen is getting to the actual spinal cord itself. Um, and then when we think about signs and symptoms, because it is a cord pathology, it's going to be bilateral. So they're going to present with bilateral sensory and motor deficits in, in two or four limbs, depending on the level, right? But most often this is going to clear within that 15 minutes to 48 hours. So it can be several minutes. It can be several days before you actually know whether or not um, that patient is going to be a permanent quadriplegia. So in terms of treatment, if this is the case, we refer out, they'll do some type of MRI, a nerve conduction velocity test um, to rule out uh, neural issues or neural compromise. But this is outside of the scope of our practice, right? We're referring this out. We can identify it by doing the upper and lower quarter screen and seeing where the dysfunctions arise in terms of sensory and motor deficits. And then we have to refer that out and they typically are hospitalized and they're constantly being observed and, and doing the test that I mentioned down here in the treatment segment below. The neck pa next pathology that we see most often in football, as the name in implies, spear, tacklers, spine, uh, most often seen in offensive and defensive linemen, but certainly running backs in um, getting tackled. Essentially, when we think about spear, tackler, spine, it's an injury to the, the cervical spine. Um, and the name itself was derived from um, a football injury where you have two or more players that run in e to each other and their heads um, collide upon impact. So there's the top of the skull collides with the top of the skull of the, the other athlete creating an axial load in the neck um, and putting the cervical spine in a crazy dangerous position uh, with a little bit of slight flexion. Remember we talked about if we could design an injury that would be just be a terrible injury to have, it would be that axial load with a little bit of extension or a flexion moment, right? What we see um, progressively over time is this is uh, the cervical spine here, right? Um, and then as that load kind of comes through the cervical spine and that cervical spine is straight, um, it causes a buckling, right? And as that spine buckles, the force is directed centrally to a specific spine and it causes what we call is kind of a buckle fracture 
Um, and so you can see that here where you have segments of the, the vertebral body which may actually protrude um, in pieces which may then be go on to, um, to impinge upon the spinal cord. So um, because of spear tackling, which was a very terrible tackling technique to teach in 1976, the NCAA actually enacted a rule barring spear tackling. But your younger patients, they don't know any better way to tackle and so they typically will will learn how to tackle with their neck in a slightly flexed position in axial load so that's why now coaches in the um, working with youth football now have to actually be trained um, to teach students how to uh, tackle properly to avoid what we call here is the uh, spear tackler spine or the buckle fracture which is catastrophic for for patients right and these patients are going to oftentimes um, report very similar signs and symptoms as cord injuries. And so if we move to the, the next slide, we can think about um, there was a football athlete, um, Kevin Everett. I don't know if you remember this. This is a while ago. Um, he took a hit and I believe he was actually spearing. Um, and so as a result, he had a burst fracture, which compressed the spinal cord. Um, and so they went and immediately they started to do something called hypothermia treatment for cervical spinal injuries work because the spinal cord started to swell so much. It was becoming impinged within the vertebral canal. And so they packed the patient with ice, but then they also gave him a cold IV to hopefully reduce the amount of swelling within in the, in the spinal cord. So it becomes important, I'm going back here, to how do we prevent this? We prevent this by teaching proper tackling techniques. Again, the mechanism of injury is going to be slightly uh, flexed with that axial load. And the signs and symptoms, I mean, massive amounts of pain in, in the area of the fracture, maybe even a bony abnormality or a step off, lots of spasming surrounding that, depending on if the cord is involved. So if the cord is involved, then obviously you'll get bilateral signs and symptoms associated with that particular pathology. I do uh, encourage you to look up Kevin Everett and look at the, the treatment that they gave him. It was one of the first times that they actually used what we call as IV hypo hypothermia um, to cool down a patient. They also put him in a hypothermic room to drop his body temperature and I believe placed him in a coma so that they could drop the body temperatures enough to reduce the spinal cord swelling. All right, onward to things that we're probably most comfortable with, an acute muscle strain. Um, this this can is go, always going to happen as a result of either over overstretching of a muscle group, right? So a sudden turn of a head, forced flexion, hyperextension or rotation. Typically, we see most muscle strains in the cervical spine um, that impact the upper traps, the scalenes, and the spleny muscles, and we'll talk about those on the next slides to follow. But in terms of signs and symptoms, localized pain in the muscular area, tenderness to palpation in that uh, region, restricted range of motion, of course, that's going to depend on the muscle that's actually involved, and then reluctance to move the neck in any direction. So this is going to be all mechanical, right? We're thinking mechanical pain, if you're seeing that and tracking that. Um, there are generally, ha, no, ridiculous signs and symptoms. So in other words, patient who has a muscle strain most often doesn't have ridiculous signs and symptoms. In fact, if they do, you can most often rule out a muscle strain most often. Although um, a person with ridiculous symptoms certainly could have a muscle strain secondarily to whatever caused the injury itself. So we're going to rice. We may see collar if they're having difficulty moving their neck. And oftentimes, if there's a lot of spasms associated with the actual pathology or a lot of pain uh, will give patients muscle relaxants which will cause the muscles to relax um, and allow the muscle time to actually heal itself. So the two most common muscles um, that will be important as we work to stabilize the neck right after a muscle strain are going to be the deep neck flexors in particular the longest colli and the longest capitis they are the deep neck flexors that we've talked about especially as we were talking about upper cross syndrome right we said strengthen those neck muscles so you can kind of see them there most anterior muscles are going to be muscles uh, neck flexor flexor muscles and so we want to work to strengthen those muscles as best we can so we can create more stability about the neck as we progress um, we have muscles on the posterior um, aspect of the neck right which will also warrant us to work on kind of creating some stability about the neck as well 
Remember in upper cross syndrome, we talked a lot about tight muscles and we talked a lot about um, inhibited muscles. So this is a beautiful depiction of that. So remember your tight muscles anteriorly are going to be the pecs, which aren't illustrated here on this image. But what is illustrated here are the upper traps and the levator scapulae. So the levator scapulae, remember, is a tight muscle in that upper trap uh, muscle is also, okay, I'm just going to put it here. The upper trap muscle is also um, a muscle that's very overactive. But then remember we said there are muscles that are pretty weak, right? Those middle and, and you don't see lower traps here. Those are pretty, pretty weak muscles. And so we're going to work to kind of strengthen those. And that's why I'm showing you there. In addition to that, we also talked about other muscles that might be kind of weak or inhibited. Um, but based on this, what do you all think? Which muscles do you think would be weak or inhibited um, and might need more strengthening? You got it. If you set the scalenes right, which are uh, neck muscles, uh, neck flexors as well, you'll work on strengthening those um, to kind of uh, make them more active and support the neck and provide more stability about the neck. So um, one of the things that we can use is um, cervical flexion movement pattern test. And we're going to do this in lab, so I don't want to spend a lot of time here. But this cervical flexion movement pattern test has been used to kind of determine the interplay of the deep neck flexors um, and the synergist. So those uh, sternocleidomastoid and scalene muscles. Um, so in other words, do they fire in order? Um, and if they do, then great. We know training is needed, but if they don't, then we have to retrain those deep neck flexors so that they can fire in a specific order. So again, we'll do this in class, so I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time here. The next pathology that uh, we're going to talk about is whiplash or a cervical sprain that is different than a strain. Remember, a sprain is going to be to a ligamentous structure. Most often, this happens because there's a violent whipping of the neck into an extension flexion moment, snapping the neck kind of back. Most often, this is, occurs in a car accident, but certainly doesn't have to. It can happen in athletics as well. But we have damage to the um, anterior, posterior, interspinous ligaments. And so they're stretching. And what do you get with a ligamentous injury? Remember, we talked about that. Lots of muscle spasm, delayed pain, tenderness to palpation on the transverse and spinous process, right? Because we're the ligaments, the site of ligamentous attachment. But the big things, delayed pain, muscle spasm, and we can even include in there probably movement of some sort, right? All right. So in terms of management with whiplash, the initial onset, we want to rule out a fracture or a dislocation always disc or cord injury so those are all the catastrophic pathologies then next we're going to rise for 48 to 72 hours maybe some NSAIDs mechanical traction um, and then maybe even muscle relaxants depending on the amount of spasms occurring about the neck after the uh, initial insult our next pathology is going to be a brachial plexus neuropraxia or a brachial plexus stretch, stretch or as many of you might call it a stinger or a uh, burner um, so there are many predictors in um, of brachial plexus uh, neuropraxia in college football players. And I will just give you a spoiler alert. Um, essentially, there are different positions, right, that are going to be more apt to um, suffering from a brachial plexus neuropraxia. The level of play is also going to subject patients more so to a uh, brachial plexus neuropraxia and history of injury. Remember, the more and more that they've injured that site, the more at risk they are for developing brachial plexus uh, neuropraxia. So, there are many causes of a burner or a stinger, but we're going to focus on the orthopedic kind of components. Um, most often, it is a blow to the um, anterior aspect of the neck. And so we have what we call is temporary dysfunction um, after a blow to the head, neck, or shoulder. In particular, it's a blow to kind of this, this place called Irv's Point. Irv's Point. Does anyone know what it is? Let's see. So Irv's Point as an anatomical structure is essentially located... Um, right in this area so about two to three centimeters above the the clavicle and it, it is the sweet spot it is the sweet spot because um, it is the place where c5 and c6 uh, nerve roots kind of come come together or converge right and so um this is this if you think about it is going to disrupt most often the c5 c6 
uh, a nerve root, which will become important when you're thinking about upper quarter screens. In terms of common occurrence in collegiate sports um, like football, 65 to 75, 70 percent of collegiate football players will experience a stinger in their um, in career. And the hard part is that 87 percent of those players will probably have some sort of recurrent symptoms. And again, it goes back to that history of the injury and the sensitivity of the stretch the soft tissue in, involved in that particular pathology. So how do we actually uh, injure the brachial plexus? So you can have a traction. You can see that there is stretching of the brachial plexus. You can have direct trauma to herbs point or that area just above the clavicle, or you can compress or impinge it, right? So a lateral flexion moment, which causes impingement. So you can have a distraction moment, a compression moment, or a direct blow. Either of those can cause brachial plexus neurological signs and symptoms. So as we think about this, um, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, if I were a student, what would I want to know about brachial plexus? So how does it actually happen? So it's an acute injury most often. Either it's an overstretching, a compression, or a direct blow. And then they have this, on, um, this acute onset of transient pain on the side of the actual injury, which is associated with numbness and tingling in the neck, most often in the C5, C6 nerve root areas. Um, the trap and uh, the deltoid may also be painful regions, but will also spasm to protect. And so you're going to see radiation into the arm, hand, and fingers in the C5, C6 nerve root distributions. You're going to complain of a burning or electrical shock or jolt that goes from the cervical spine into the upper arm, hence the name burner or stinger. And they may have what we call is a dead arm. Um, and that really has to do has to do with C5, C6 nerve roots being compressed. And so you may not have neuromuscular communication from the C, C5, C6 nerve roots as they converge for a very short period of time. In terms of our upper quarter scream, your myotome and dermatomes for C5, C6 most often are going to be abnormal, but certainly will be transient. So they'll be restored. But big things, ruling out fracture and dislocation of the cervical spine, ruling out spinal stenosis, hard to do in the clinical setting, but certainly can do it with an x-ray. And so what we're going to do to rule it in is we're going to perform the brachial plexus stress test and the Sperling's test. I think I have an image of that on the next slide. The key to reducing the risk of recurrence is, and this is really hard, especially in the sport of football, is you do not return them to play until they have full strength, range of motion, and no ridiculous symptoms, which is so hard to do when you're thinking about football coaches uh, if they have function of the, the shoulder. So we want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence there. If we don't, we increase the risk of recurrent signs and symptoms, and then they'll be your patient forever, um, and you won't get rid of them. So here are some things that we've seen happen over time, right? So we can see herbs point kind of here. We can see where that injury actually happens. Either you have that overstretching or compression or direct blow too. So they created what are called cowboy collars. Um, and the cowboy collar, as you can see, kind of supports the cervical spine and doesn't allow as much range of motion in a lateral direction. So you'll see most Often your defensive and offensive linemen will be wearing these cowboy collars and that's intentional because as they get ready to wrap or tackle, um, they were going into lateral flexion moments and they were suffering from stingers. And so the development of the cowboy collar, you can see it here, uh, doesn't afford as much lateral flexion. And so there, we've seen a reduction in the number of brachial plexus injuries that we have been reported, at least in the, the sport of football. So here is Sperling's test. You can see um, you're having your patient uh, lean back into an extension moment with rotation and we're applying an axial load to the patient's head. And so what you'll see with that is, uh, number one, you might get radiculopathy, which could essentially um, cause cord issues or peripheral nerve issues, right? Um, so this is a really good test to elicit um, cervical radiculopathy because what you're doing essentially is narrowing the foramen or the space uh, in which the spinal cord and the peripheral nerve roots live. So in terms of results and conclusion, um, most common mechanism of, of injury, at least for cervical spine injuries, is going to be like forced compression. compression. Forced compression is most often going to be associated with fractures and or dislocation, right? Uh, if I could conclude, conclude one thing, recurrent stingers usually result from the same mechanism um, and occurred on the same side. So let me say it this way. A lateral flexion moment um, 
on the same side of the tractional force and most often they had a brachial plexus stretch. So what do we wanna do to prevent current recurrent stingers? The initial mechanism must be addressed and we must do exercises. So if we go back to this slide here where we said we do not return a patient, right? Um, until they have full range of motion, full strength, and no ridiculous symptoms, that will help reduce the uh, recurrent signs and symptoms or recurrent patients that we'll see in our clinic over time. The next pathology um, is one to not take lightly. It's vertebral artery occlusion. So I'm going to kind of trace the uh, vertebral artery with my pen here. So you can see that vertebral artery here. Essentially, what is it? As the name implies, it's a stenosis um, or instability about a vertebral body um, or a blunt force trauma that may cause some type of claudication or a lack of blood flow coming from the vertebral artery to the actual uh, brain, right? Um, and so you have this interruption of blood flow, which is extremely important. If the brain is deprived for, of blood for too long, right, this, the cells start to die. So this certainly can be a medical emergency. In terms of signs and symptoms, remember we talked a lot about cervical spine injuries not really being associated with dizziness, right? This is one condition, such condition, in the cervical spine that would be associated with that dizziness or disorientation. And then patients will also have nystagmus, which is where the eyes bounce back and forth uh, rapidly. They might report nausea um, and will certainly uh, suffer from pup pupillary changes. So we're going to do what is called a vertebral artery test. We're going to have that patient lay down in a supine position. We're going to extend the neck and rotate. And most often you'll start to see the eyes bounce back and forth, back and forth uh, repetitively. That'd be a positive vertebral artery test. Um, and so in that, that case, we're referring that patient out. Um, if symptoms reproduce with extension and rotation, so if we, uh, in addition to nystagmus, we have dizziness or disorientation, then we're referring out to an MD before we start doing anything else to see if blood flow has been restored. So let's look at it this way. I mean, if you look at the vertebral artery, it is a major conduit or major supplier um, to the actual brain itself. So anytime you have compromise to the vertebral artery, right, which if we were to kind of trace the vertebral artery here uh, and the vertebral artery here, you can see it contributes to blood flow to the circle of Willis, which is responsible for providing blood flow to the actual brain itself. So uh, a vertebral artery compromise or occlusion can be very catastrophic to the patient over time. So we've already talked about acute uh, torticollis kind of as an observation standpoint, but not actually as a pathology. So as I mentioned before, it can either be acquired, right, or it can be congenital. Um, we're, what we're referring to here, though, is going to be the acquired form. So uh, most often it's brought on by some type of spasm of the sternocleidomastoid, usually as a result of some type of sleeping position. So your patient's going to wake up and report that they can't rotate their neck, like it's super painful for them to do that. Um, the signs and symptoms, tenderness to palpation of the sternocleidomastoid, muscle spasm, restricted range of motion most often in, in rotation opposite that. Um, in terms of management, uh, traction, a slow load tractional moment will cause a releasing of the muscle spasm. Uh, couple that with superficial heat and, and your, your golden. Um, the patient can take 800 milligrams of ibuprofen. And a soft collar is often been encouraged in patients with acute torticollis who can't navigate moving, rotating their neck. So we'll rotate them during treatment and put them in a soft collar, which will just keep that neck in its perfect alignment and in, in its position. Pretty harmless um, condition, unless of course you have the congenital condition down here. We can see in this image, you see that massive spasming of the sternocleidomastoid. Um, and so if you're born with that, an excessively smaller or shorter uh, sternocleidomastoid, then they may have to go in and surgically repair that. And I think I've talked through that. Okay, now I want to end us on some evidence-based practice. So the what we we learned, um, uh, clinical prediction rules, right? We had the Ottawa prediction rules for the ankle, and now we're moving to the Canadian C-spine clinical prediction rule, uh, which obviously come out of Canada. I don't know, um, but it is a kind of a set of evidence-based practice guidelines that help you decide if you feel like cervical spine imaging is appropriate or not appropriate for the trauma patient sitting in front of you, right? And so um, it is warranted after trauma. 
but it is only applicable to patients who are obviously alert and in stable condition where we suspect a cervical spine injury um, is of concern, right? This is going to be the biggest, the biggest thing. They have to be alert and they have to be stable. Um, it's usually not a- applicable in non-trauma cases. So a chronic patient comes in and is complaining of neck pain, right? So we're not applying it to that particular patient. Obviously, if a patient has unstable vital signs or acute paralysis or vertebral artery disease, we're just referring that out. So this is the acute cervical spine patient that is stable and able to answer questions. This is who we're applying that to clinically. I need you to kind of understand that. Okay, so as we look at the clinical prediction rules, uh, the Canadian C-spine clinical prediction rules, um, we have to look at risk factors. So first and foremost, the first step in this process is, is there there any high risk fracture present that would require cervical spine um, uh, imaging. So the first question is, are they 65 years or older? If so, then we autom- and they're reporting with neck pain, we automatically refer them for radiography, right? Um, did they have some sort of dangerous mechanism? I'll give you an example. Fall from elevation of greater than three feet, right? Or five stairs, an axial load to the head. High- they were involved in some sort of maybe motor vehicle collision where they were going faster than 70 miles per hour. Um, were they in a bicycle collision collision, or do they have paresthesia in the extremities? If the answer to any of those is yes, then we automatically refer out for radiography. If the answer to these is no, then we move to the next box. Does that make sense? And we say, okay, if is is there any low risk factor present? So an example would be, um, were they in a simple rear end motor vehicle collision? Um, this means, so maybe they, they were, they, this excludes being hit by a high speed vehicle or a large vehicle um, or a rollover. So you're going 20 miles per hour and you were rear ended would be an example of that, right? They were able to drive themselves and sit um, in the emergency department they were ambulatory at any point in time. They had delayed onset of neck pain. Uh, they have absence of mid C line tenderness, right? If the answer to um, if the answer to any of those, so if they don't have any of these presents, then we don't need radiography, right? If the answer is yes, then we're going to come down here and we're going to ask one more question before we send them. Are they able to actively rotate their neck 45 degrees to the left or right? If the answer is no, they're not, then they're going to get radiography. If the answer is yes, then we don't need radiography. So as we think through this progression, it's a step-by-step progression. Do they have a high risk factor present? Yes or no. If the answer is yes, radiography. If the answer is no, we're going to come down here. And what we're going to say, if any of, if these are no, um, then the answer is no. If any of these is yes, we're going to come down here. We're going to say, can they rotate? If the answer is no, we're going to radiography. If the answer is yes, we aren't going to radiography. This is a really good way to kind of use the evidence to help decide whether or not they actually need um, some sort of radiography. And just like the auto rules, when you use this Canadian C-spine prediction rule, oftentimes when you refer out for radiography and you're checking the yes boxes, then most often there is usually a fracture dislocation present in the cervical spine. Okay, that is the end of the acute pathology lectures. I hope you've learned a lot. We've covered multiple pathologies which will impact the cervical spine. So I'm hoping that this is helpful as you progress into, um, I don't know, I guess as you get ready to encounter the 66% of patients who will report to you with some form of neck pain in your um, athletic training career.